if we have to get rid of something, can we bring something in its place? And that is why we called on Professor Andre Juster from University of Stellenbosch. He's an agricultural economist, and his previous time when I met him was Potatoes SA, to give us an idea of what is the impact of the regulatory environment in our country on getting that new backup technology in behind something which we have to get rid of in the next couple of years. So um, without any further discussion, I'm going to hand over to Andre. Thank you, Andre. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Program Director. Um, I don't think I'm going to give all the answers that, that, you, that you seek. I had a number of discussions with some of the colleagues that's also present here uh, in the room to try and figure out uh, what is in that list that, <laughs> that Sarah spoke about because you need that list so that you can quantify. Um, so I'll, I'll rather talk about uh, more broad points and uh, use a broad paintbrush as far as policy pointers are concerned because I think uh, what we heard this morning is that the the issue of configuring policy is is critically important um, so I'll, I'll try and highlight some of those uh, issues um, I think, and Tracy, you will probably agree with me, uh, if you go back a couple of years, um, it was actually a rare occurrence that agricultural economists uh, share a stage with colleagues of this nature of a very specialized, um, on a very specialized topic, actually. Um, and earlier this year, I also had the privilege uh, to share or participate in another forum where it was mainly agricultural economists, but uh, there were soil uh, scientists also present during that conference, and they made a huge contribution to the thinking about the economy of, of all of these things. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is we are trying to solve very complex problems, multidimensional problems, and I think from a policy point of view, it then also becomes critically important that we get all the various disciplines that can contribute in one way or another to solving those complicated problems. It's not one-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional, and hence we also need to approach it in that particular manner. <coughs> so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but I'm going to cover a, a whole lot of issues just to create perspective. Um, I think perspective is, is, is vitally important, and. As an economist, I'm going to focus on the, more on the monetary issues, and that's also the key message that I have today, is that we need to look at some of the monetary issues pertaining to the environment uh, that we're in. So, but let's start with the context. So what this slide, or the first, uh, this graph on the right-hand side shows you, is the product, production index for various different regions. Africa, there you can see since 1992 an increase in 139%, the EU only by 10.65%. South Africa, 96% increase in, in production according to the index, the US 40% and globally we at 80%. And the reason why I chose 1992 is because that was the McSherry uh, policy directives in the EU where they started moving away uh, to, uh, from market support to direct income support. In other words, they changed the way that the subsidies or the support to the European farmers are being applied. And that was also the first time where some environmental obligations were put on the table. And so subsequent years in 2013 uh, and the 2020 proposals for the 2023 20, to 2027, that is actually where the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy started to, to feature quite, quite strongly. So I think it's just important to understand the timelines, but also the other important story is the growth in productivity in different regions in the world, and, I, and that is obviously due to a number of factors. So if we just look at the EU specifically, they've got a small-scale uh, nature of their farms, um, much smaller than what we, for example, have in, in, in South Africa, where they are all very reliant also on the, on the subsidies, and we will have a look at that just now. 
Um, there was in the previous session, there was mention of the non-adoption -adop and the resistance to, to GMO crops. Um, also due to a number of factors, a relatively poor adoption of precision farming um, technologies, mainly based on the scale of their operation. So one can arguably say that the, compared to what we see on the graph, a relatively lower productivity uh, in the EU. And uh, yet one can also argue, you know, are their farming practices uh, environmentally friendly or or unfriendly, uh, based on the on the farm on the farm structure. So let's have a look at uh, pesticide use uh, globally. So on the slide you can see right there at the bottom is Africa. Uh, second from the bottom is South Africa, followed by the United States and then the European Union, and then right there at the top is is China. So it just gives you an, a relative indication of you know, what is the pesticide use globally, and there is just a map to give you an indication of where pesticide use is most concentrated. Right there at the bottom, you can see about 4 million tons of pesticide use annually globally, of which 400,000 tons is in the, UA, uh, in the EU, and about 27,000 tons, an estimate by the FAO in 2020. 20 in South Africa. So maybe just to have a, a quick look at the fertilizer industry. So there you can see fertilizer use uh, in sub-Saharan Africa well below 20 kilograms. You can have a look there at the EU, right there at the top, uh, over 140 kilograms per annum. South Africa is below 80 kilograms per annum. And then on the right hand side you can see that in Western Europe fertilizer use have been declining over time, Northern Europe more or less sideways, um, and then again South Africa there at the bottom uh, at 50 kilograms. So the, just a distinguishing factor between these two graphs, the one e on the left hand side is the fertilizer used per hectare, and the right hand side is per unit of agricultural land, it's two different measurement units. Okay, so how is all of this uh, funded, or how is, what is the support to the agricultural sectors in the respective countries? So when we measure the support, we use the producer subsidy or support equivalent. So this is just basically an, annuitary, an annual monetary value of the gross transfers from consumers uh, to producers. So you can see there, although the subsidy, the PSE for the European Union has been coming do down quite significantly, um, it is hovering around about 20% of uh, gross production value in the, in the European Union. Uh, the US is around uh, 10%, and then right there at the bottom, we see Brazil and South Africa. So the relevance of this slide will become uh, clear uh, once I get to my, to my last slide. So this is just the percentage. So we're comparing 5% versus 20%. But I think what is critically important is that we actually have a look at the monetary value. So the PSE in terms of monetary value, there you can see South Africa right there at the bottom, basically moving sideways, and you can see right at the top is the European Union. So in terms of monetary value, the support to the agricultural sector in, in the EU as well as in the United States, as an example, is far, far more than what we have uh, in South Africa. If you, if you look at the general support, the services support, that is support provided in terms of R&D, uh, infrastructure, uh, training, all of those activities. Again, South Africa is right there at the bottom, whilst our countries that we compete with and to where we export our products are right there at the top. So there's a significant difference in terms of what government support our farmers receive in South Africa versus those farmers in the EU and for that matter also in the United States. Okay, basically this slide sums up what we have already heard this morning, but I think what is also important is that we need to understand where, where all of this comes from. So if you look at the citizens in Europe, very uh, much environmentally uh, conscious and where they prioritize the environment, 70% in Germany, 65% in Italy, 59% in France. And so we see an increasing dominance of the green parties 
in the legislature in Europe. In other words, people that's uh, driving the policy direction within Europe. So this is coming from the citizens of Europe who is electing these people into these positions. And from there we see the European Green Deal and the farm to food uh, strategy. We've already discussed the proposed uh, declines in fertilizer and pesticide use. Um, also the area under organic farming uh, that is proposed. I'm not going to discuss uh, all of these items. And then again, very prominent in all of these plans is how are we going to finance this? And there are various different programs that the EU will use at, that, will, that they could potentially use to finance what they envisage uh, to do through this plan. What we also heard this morning, um, there is a lot of uncertainty still. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the uncertainties is a problem because it doesn't really guide us to what the EU is exactly planning to do. On the other hand, it presents a huge opportunity for us from a policy point of view and for, from an organizational point of view to say, but we have a gap here to form a proper policy statement, uh, similar to what Lindy mentioned this morning, is what is the South African policy directives as far as this is concerned. These figures were also mentioned this morning, and I think it's also just important to understand that there's also internal EU resistance uh, towards the farm to fork strategy, which is understandable if you, if you see what the potential impacts of all of this will be. So if we look at the farm to fork strategy, I'll come back to that point. Uh, what, what struck me is that word just transition. Um, and I'll, I'll make some, some um, mention of that again later. And then we have already spoken this morning about the mirror clauses and also that the EU will enforce all of their uh, different uh, trade and sustainability, sustainability uh, and the provisions into the trade agreements that they are currently uh, negotiating. Okay, so I thought, I said I'm going to focus on the money. Um, so if you look at this particular slide, um, between 2010 and 2014, it basically costed the company $286 million uh, to bring a new product to market. Um, and then if you look at the, the next, uh, the table at the bottom, you mentioned some, some timelines earlier. Um, between 2010 and 2015, the average time to bring a product to market was in the region of 11 years. So what is the monetary interest of all of this? So that if you're investing uh, close to 290 million rands, it takes you about 12 years or 11 years to bring it to market. You need to consider what is your, your returns on investment going to be after that particular time period. So if you start bringing new products into South Africa, what is the returns on investment going to be? within the context of your policy environment. So there's certain implications that we need to consider. What is the protection of business information given these huge investments? If you have a non-optimal uh, regulatory system, uh, that could potentially jeopardize investments in new products in your, in your industry, and it can also be stifling uh, new uh, innovation. So I think these issues Rod, was also mentioned this morning that it is critically important to do this. The other complication is that when you have your large research-based companies um, with these huge investments that are required, they will probably most uh, will focus on your bigger crops like your citrus, your grapes, potatoes and cereals and where you have very uh, a lot of other crops that could potentially be introduced like your berries, uh, like products like uh, vegetables, um, they could fall by the wayside in terms of the investment that is required. And if you put all of these issues uh, together. Okay, so if we look at the, the cost of crop product protection in South Africa, it's a value of around about 12.3 billion rands. The majority of that goes to, towards uh, citrus. Um, and then your biopesticides industry uh, is about 19% of this total cost being sp spent on, on biochemicals. So this slide is just saying, you know, there are certain uh, chemicals that are under risk and there are certain industries that are most at risk. The, the issue here is, you spoke about uh, integrated pest management uh, this morning. 
So it just complicates the whole issue of uh, pest, integrated pest management. Um, and I didn't really understand this situation fully until I started working for Potato South Africa to understand what is the, the problems as far as chemical use is concerned when it gets to, to potato production. So it opened up a completely new world to me. The other issue that was briefly mentioned this morning is the whole issue of our merging commercial producers. Um, to just put it in context, if we look at our statutory levies that's collected by the National Agricultural Marketing Council, about 600 million rands is annually is spent on the transformation of the sector. So that money being spent there could potentially put that money in, uh, in, in risk if we don't sort out the issues that we need to address. So if you look globally, about six, uh, over 600 uh, active ingredients that are available. Um, this graph at the bottom gives you an idea of the number of new active ingredients introduced uh, per decade, and the graph just below that is actually per year. So the number of new products or actives coming into the market is actually uh, declining, and you should probably see an increase in the new biological markets. So I think it has an issue that pertains to what choices do you have left if lesser and lesser new actives come into the market and you remove uh, uh, other important actives that are in the market. So this is an issue that, that needs to be discussed and is further explored. The end result is if we take a, a really low road scenario, is we're looking at our farmers losing their competitiveness um, because they don't have access to, to new products, uh, and which is one of the causes uh, could be due to long regulatory <coughs> processes. Um, the unintended consequences, obviously, of this is uh, loss of farm labor. Um, we could see uh, the lack of or slower rate of bringing new technologies into South Africa due to, due to uncertainty. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, we could run into food security problems, and we know that food security problems, especially in a politi politically unstable environment, is a, a huge risk. So, um, being an, uh, I don't know whether I should say an optimist or a pessimist. Do you know what's the definition for a pessimist? It's an optimist with experience. But in any case. Um, so let's go to the, to the next slide. So have there been initiatives by government to address, address the issues? Yes. Um, in 2010, there was already uh, some activities or initiatives taking place where a review of the Act 36 took place and the suggestions that was gazetted by government was that there is changes that, you need, that need to take place. Um, in terms of the objectives of this government gazette, was the, 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 an improvement in the legislative framework is required to basically protect South Africans, uh, to, well, to ensure that South Africans are protected in terms of health and environmental risks. I'm not going to read through all of those. Uh, the fact of the matter, a lot of the issues that has been addressed over the last two years um, are mentioned here as the issues that needs to be addressed. And I think um, <clears throat> if we look at the the fourth bullet there, increased transparency, access to information, and improved uh, public participation. I think we, we're seriously making some, some movement there, and that, um, and that will come on the next slide. I think the other encouraging um, issue that we look at this uh, government gazette is that it calls for public participation. In other words, the PPP, where government and the public sector uh, and the private sector actually works, works together. And this was also then included into the strategic plan of the then DAF, which is today known as DALRAD. So progress in terms of all of those uh, objectives, I was not able to determine how far we are in terms of targets and target dates. The, the SAFE um, initiative, I think, is really a huge in step in, in the right direction. Um, I put there up a team. You know what team stands for? Together, everybody achieves more. And if I look at the outcomes and the document that was signed and the areas that, that is addressing in terms of communication, the management systems, the human resource capacity, registration process, legislation, regi uh, registration tariffs, as well as training, um, and, and you look at the document. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a public document yet, Rod, but 
it is an absolutely well written document and and the wish is that when we take that document and what, what was encouraging to hear this morning rod is that uh, government and the private sector has actually signed this document so it means there's commitment to achieve the action plans in that document and and, and that is great that is what we that is actually what we what we want to see uh, sometimes we, we tend to be, or uh, when people comment on certain environments, we tend to feel that we are victimized, if that is the right word to use. That is really not the intention when we say something is, uh, is in need of improvement. So it's not necessarily wrong, but given the changing environment in, in which we are and where we need to address certain things, uh, it is important that we then uh, work towards and work together to, to address the different challenges. Then we have the, the I, do I, are you sitting in a different way because my time is finished, Farad? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's a subtle gesture that I should finish. Um, but then we have the, the, the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. So in this plan, uh, the, the, the issues that is being addressed by the SAFE and government initiative is also being addressed. So there's two really critically important policy documents that specifically state what needs to be done at the end of the day. So let me just present you with another dilemma briefly. So these are all the different acts. So we've been talking about Act 36. But these are all the different acts that interlink or could, could potentially interlink with each other with regards to issues being discussed within the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. So the question is, how are we going to harmonize all of these different policies? And it actually requires expertise and man, manpower and a lot of people that needs to engage to harmonize all of these policies. So we're not even talking about harmonization in the region or harmonization with EU policies. We're talking harmonization of South African policies that are in one way or another talking to exactly the same type of things under the European Green Deal. So just to complicate stuff, then we have some new bills that are currently at Parliament that brings in a new dimension in the way that we will actually um, do our business. In other words, this is the environment that determines, or the documents that determine how we do business, the rules of the game. Then we have the, the European uh, regulations, and they have their own policies, the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, the Zero Pollution Action Plan, the EU Soil Strategy. And then the question is, but if we harmonize our policies internally, how do we align it with that of the European Union? And then in addition, in addition, we have our international conventions, the IPPC, the OIE, and Codex Alimentarius. And then, just to put the cherry on top of that, we have our voluntary and private standards. So this is a huge task that we have to address. Otherwise, we're going to uh, see some problems for ourselves in the future. And we, like I said earlier, we have the opportunity now. We have the opportunity now. So, I'm nearly finished. So this is just a policy process. So I'm not going to go through the detail, but you can see sometimes, and that is uh, some of my experience, is that we sometimes approach policy in a haphazard way. But this diagram shows you there's a clear starting point and there's a clear ending point. And you need to follow these steps very diligently to make sure that your policy is implementable at the end of the day and empowers your industry. So given my lack of time, I will not spend too much time on this. So in an ideal world, um, and I think just for the audience, those of you that are not involved in policy processes, this is how we all would like it to be. You go through all of those steps and boom, bang, you have your policy in place and everybody is happy afterwards. This is how it really works. It's a back and forth process. And that's why all stakeholders need to be on board from point number one, or from step number one. And that's why step number one on the previous slide is critically important because that is where you ideate what you actually want to achieve and that determines who needs to be on board and what will be their contributions throughout the process. I'm just going back one, there's an important issue that I just need to mention. If you look at right at the bottom of this particular slide, it says co-creation. And that is what it's all about, co-creation. 
not one-dimensional creation of policy. And that is something that we actually need to get right. So here's my summary. I said I will ask uh, a, a question. So I, I've been struggling to actually figure out what does the word a just transition mean. And I think once we understand what the word means and what is the intention of that word, um, it will also clear our minds because at this stage it's not 100% clear, at least from my vantage point, when, when, we, when we look at the, the farm to fork strategy. Will the EU stop what they are doing because we say that there are certain risks? No, they will not. They will go ahead. Um, yet there are many uncertainties, and it's been highlighted this morning. Um, and if you look at more recent papers on this particular issue, it actually goes into some of the, the details of all of the uncertainties related to the farm to fork strategy and where it actually will fit in and what will be the eventual outcomes uh, when it comes to the table in a, in a formal manner. Um, the last slides that I mentioned, I think uh, if we look at this environment and the opportunity that exists, um, there's a real need for policy harmonization. And either we look at this one dimensionally and we sit here after three or four years and we wonder what happened, why didn't we fix everything? We have the time now. We need to invest in that now. Okay, do we have the funding? So now I'm coming back to the money. So if you look at these two graphs on the right hand side, if you look at the PSEs, in other words, the support provided to the agricultural sector to fix what they actually want to achieve through their policy imperatives, the EU have 51 times more money per hectare to do that. If you look at the GSSE, the General Support Services, okay, I don't have that, I looked at it uh, at a per capita level. At a per capita level, they have 22 more times uh, more money to achieve their policy objectives than we have in South Africa. Okay, so that brings a completely different dimension to the task ahead and whether we actually have the funding, because we can put all of this on paper, but if we're not able to implement, it actually means nothing. And in order to implement, we need the money. So this is a little bit of a wake-up call when I calculated these figures to realize this is how far we are behind. We, there's an Afrikaans saying that I can't mention now, but it has something to do with thunder. Um, it, feel, it feels like that. Um, that you need them. If you don't have the money, it's not going to work. We, we are wasting our time. And I think that will be a very important message to our policymakers that we need to leverage money. Whether it is from government or other sources, it will be critically important for whatever policy directives we want to achieve in the future. <clears throat> so what happens if we don't get it right? We jeopardize the National Development Plan objectives as well as the AAMP, the Agricultural and Agro-Processing Plan uh, objectives. Okay, Mr. Chair, if we, if we don't get that right, I thought I'd bring a little bit of, since this is a South African conference, now here you have international gates, I thought I'd just put that in. The Afrikaans people in the room will understand what that stands for. Um, but that's what will happen if, if it doesn't work. In English it means then we will have trouble. Okay. <laughs> Gee, thank you very much. Um, hopefully I have it.